Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spect imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Well, welcome every day, everybody. Today is a very special Brain Warriors Way podcast. We have our friend, uh, internationally best-selling author, neurologist, teacher, uh, the author of Grain Brain, Brain Maker, uh, the Grain Brain Whole Life Plan, and really someone I think Tan and I consider yes. our teacher. Yeah. Uh, who. Um, who is also a nutritionist and uh, someone I have referred many patients to over the years. Uh, and he is uh, affectionately called the empowering neurologist, uh, David Perlmutter. Welcome, David. What a joy yes, to spend thank time you. with My pleasure, you. indeed. I like the part about affectionately call, uh, called. <laughs> I've, I've never heard that before, but I like the notion of affection. That's great. Thank you. Yes. I just have to say, i am it's such a joy for me because I actually had the pleasure of hearing you speak, oh gosh, probably 10 years ago, and I was so fascinated. And from that point on, I considered you a mentor and I followed you and I was so excited. And of course, you come home and your friends, you became friends with them. And so I, I was just so excited to be able to actually have you become my mentor and join us and teach our community. This is amazing. So every time you are on, well, let me just say, as they say, right back at you, because you guys have taught me a lot, not the least of which was the important value of buying a ping pong table. And I <laughs> just say, well, thank you for that. That's awesome. So he also is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. They have published six of my papers. We got a new paper accepted on using imaging to predict treatment response with depression. So we're pretty excited about that. And I know both you and I are um, huge believers in the concept of preventing Alzheimer's disease. In fact, we should live our lives mm -hmm. uh, in an Alzheimer's prevention program because it starts in the brain years before people have any symptoms. But, but one of the things that you became famous for was Grain Brain. Brain, grain brain was a huge bestseller for a long time. It uh, really helped change the way people think about their diet. So what triggered that for you? What, what got you interested in writing that and particularly talking about gluten? Well, let's uh, you know, wind the clock back. Grain Brain was published five years ago. And uh, at that time, I had reached a real threshold, I think, of frustration in that just seeing Alzheimer's patients day in and day out and looking at the statistics uh, indicating that, you know, by age uh, 65, your chances are one in nine. They increase uh, dramatically till you're one in two, 50 50 chance at age 85. And at the same time, literature coming out in our most well respected journals indicating that various lifestyle choices seem to be strongly related to risk. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a neurologist, we don't have a lot of treatment options for many of the issues that we deal with. And certainly as it relates to uh, Alzheimer's disease, we have nothing. There is nothing in the pharmacy cabinet there that I could give to an Alzheimer's patient that would have any bearing on the course of that disease. So I don't like to be left empty handed. I wanted some tools in my toolbox. And if we had no treatment, okay, I can accept that. And you know, as we all have this conversation today, we still have no treatment. That said, we saw this emerging literature saying that there is this strong 
correlation between lifestyle choices and various biometric measurements and risk for that very disease that we all fear and for which there is no treatment. We began seeing literature that correlated, for example, even mild elevations of blood sugar, uh, obesity, uh, head trauma, uh, and all of these uh, various factors uh, over which we have some degree of control. Now, we don't have control over our genetics. We don't have any control over our gender, but we sure as heck have a lot of control over the food that we eat, the amount of physical activity that we engage in, and whether or not we experience head trauma. John Kennedy said that the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Mm -hmm. And that quote resonated with me for a long, long time, especially as a neurologist, because we have so few treatment options available to us. So uh, I you know, had already defined myself as being the odd man out in, in terms of integrative and functional medicine. Being a neurologist involved with that approach, I think, was unusual because everybody knows, you know, you have the brain that you have, nothing you do is going to change its destiny. I chose to be disruptive and not to go along with right. the party line. So I made it my mission, probably six and a half years ago, to write this book, Grain Brain, uh, really letting the public know that here is a powerful degree of empowerment that you now have to make choices that will absolutely change the destiny trajectory of your brain. And I think that uh, the message really hit a lot of people. That book's in 30 languages, uh, especially for those who are at risk by, by virtue of their gender, by virtue of their heritage, uh, by virtue of other lifestyle issues like obesity, diabetes, et cetera, that certainly are associated with increased risk. So we can't change our gender, but I think it's important to note that uh, Alzheimer's is diagnosed twice as often in women as in men. And I think that perhaps might have a role uh, in the fact that you don't hear as much as you should about the importance of preventive activity. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book that really focused on how toxic sugar and carbohydrates are for the brain, not because Dr. Perlmutter dreamed this stuff up, but because that is what our most well-respected journals were telling us, that even subtle elevations of blood sugar had a profound and detrimental effect upon the brain in terms of increasing risk for dementia. Uh, one study that came out in September of 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine followed a group of several thousand individuals for 6.7 years. And the only test they did at the beginning of the study was their fasting blood sugar. That's it, nothing exotic. They didn't do a spinal tap or a brain imaging study. They all, all they looked at was their blood sugar. They followed this group for close to seven years. And what did they find? That individuals who had even mild elevation of blood sugar had a dramatic increased risk for dementia. Well, that doesn't mean that the blood sugar elevation caused the dementia. Uh, this is a correlation, not a causation kind of report. But I sure as heck believe it did. And I sure as heck feel uh, compelled and supported in stating that lower blood sugar is better. Believe me, not just based upon that one literature citation, but countless that came at that time and certainly after that. So the other uh, fundamental uh, leg of the stool here in terms of grain brain was the notion uh, that wheat uh, in itself and by virtue of the fact that wheat contains gluten weren't going to be good for the brain. Uh, we were beginning to see a host of non-gut related issues to be seen in association with gluten consumption and gluten sensitivity. And this was early in the days when most people didn't believe there was such a thing as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, meaning a person could have a problem with the protein gluten uh, but they didn't have the autoimmune condition, celiac disease. And for many years, even after Grain Brain was written, you know, people would roll their eyes. Oh, you know, you guys, mm -hmm. the non-gluten, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. But there was research. There were symposia that were held uh, showing things like schizophrenia, uh, other uh, psychiatric uh, issues, movement disorders, uh, cognitive performance issues, et cetera, certainly migraine headaches things that would come in the radar of a neurologist could be related to sensitivity to gluten. Um, and 
in my practice, I was finding that plenty of patients improved with a variety of issues when we took them off of gluten. Mm -hmm. And we published uh, these case reports and many people thought they were interesting, especially in the integrative world and began using similar protocols, going gluten-free with their patients and seeing similar results. Mainstream still had their feet in the mud and wouldn't embrace it. Either you had celiac disease and if you didn't, eat whatever in the heck you want. So over the years, more and more data began to evolve that supported our original contentions. A research, for example, at Harvard conducted by Dr. Alessio Fasano and his group mm -hmm. revealed that gliadin, which is a protein that makes up gluten, induces leakiness of the gut in all humans. Not just those with celiac, not just those with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but all humans. Wow, why is that important for me? Why do I care about the gut? I care about it plenty because the gut regulates inflammation and it is inflammation that is the cornerstone of things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, autism, depression. So we've uh, put these very important dots together and recognize that, hey, the brain is influenced by the gut. Mm -hmm. And that opened the door to uh, the next book, which was Brain Maker, that looked at this relationship between gut and specifically the bacteria that live within the gut, how those interplay uh, through the process of inflammation. And uh, as you well know, uh, that area of research has absolutely exploded, especially uh, in terms of things that you deal with, uh, mood disorders, uh, and, you know, and getting back to one of the lifestyle uh, issues I mentioned earlier, which is head trauma and its relationship to developing dementia. You know, certainly you and your team with your work with CTE, et cetera, um, can relate to that. Uh, that's where preventive medicine comes into play. So if you're so, going to do a contact sport, you so wear a helmet. So many things. If you drive a car, you got to wear a seatbelt. Yeah. So many and, things uh, for us to So many things unpack. you can do to protect your brain. There. We have this sort of notion that the brain is what it is, and there's nothing that we do in our lifestyle choices that has any role to play in changing its destiny. We set out to, to change that, that uh, mm -hmm. paradigm. So, so what's your thought on why women? So, you know, it's well known that women have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, while you were talking, I was beginning to put together um, two dots. Women have lower levels of serotonin than men. According to one study from uh, Montreal, 52% less serotonin than men do. Serotonin is obviously associated with depression. Um, the way to increase serotonin in the brain is simple carbohydrates that cause uh, an insulin response that drives tryptophan into the brain. So now I'm thinking of women and cupcakes and their chocolate, um, but I know it's more complicated than that. What, what's well, your you know sense what? It may on- may not be. And here is uh, what, what I took away from the Montreal study. Uh, in, you know, our job is to connect dots, is to bring seemingly disparate information together to have those aha moments. Louis Pasteur told us that chance favors the prepared mind. So mm. you're reading some obscure mm -hmm. journal on the one hand and you find this study and you bring to bear other information that you may have. So the, you know, we take a step back in terms of serotonin and recognize two things. Number one, that the creation of serotonin from tryptophan uh, is at most a process that is occurring at about a 5% rate, meaning that about 5% of tryptophan ultimately becomes serotonin. Not a lot of wiggle room here. And that any factor that could influence that conversion to serotonin negatively could further decrease the availability of serotonin. Well, it turns out that inflammation itself, perhaps the cupcakes, uh, perhaps the changes in the gut bacteria that women may have for reasons that we'll talk about in a moment can influence the ability to convert tryptophan into serotonin called the kynurenic acid pathway. Any inflammation ultimately reduces availability of serotonin. So uh, we wonder what else could influence that pathway. Could hormones influence the pathway? 
I, I think that's interesting. We know that women have different arrays and diversity of their gut bacteria, which are directly involved in inflammation as well, plus or minus. Uh, I, I think that as we recognize Alzheimer's and depression for that uh, moment as well, and its relation uh, to serotonin, uh, both of these are now considered inflammatory disorders. I think if we take a step back and say, look at women's rates of depression, women's rates of Alzheimer's disease, women's rates of autoimmune conditions as well, which are twice as high as men, that there may be something going on within the gut and downstream from that at the gut lining in terms of permeability that may relate and explain these observances. Now, I think the party line would have us believe that obviously changes in hormones may be related as well. And I'm willing uh, to explore that. And obviously we have explored that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think that, you know, there are other issues that relate to um, the exposure that women have uh, to genes uh, that, are un that are not parts of their bodies. Challenging a woman's body uh, with genetic information of an with an organism that is only 50% hers. In other words, pregnancy. Mm. What is pregnancy? When that fetus is developing within a woman, that woman is to some degree, confronting her immune system with an organism that's only 50% genetically oh, the same as she, might that induce some changes in her immune tolerance and oh. in her immune reactivity? So I think there are a lot of factors to consider. I mean, these are the kinds of things you think of in the, that brief moment before you fall asleep at night, you bring <laughs> these things together. And it's, I think a lot of people think about that stuff. So I want to get practical if I could and go back to something, a couple of things you said in the beginning. Um, as a nurse and a coach, my job is to sort of advocate for patients and their questions and I get lots of them. Um, I had the, as I said earlier, um, the pleasure and um, the privilege of hearing you speak a long time ago. And so I've written eight books and a lot of them are influenced by you and Dr. Hyman and some of my other mentors. And so I've been pushing on this gluten issue for a long time because I cut it out of my life and saw a radical change in my life. Never understood why I had so many issues. When I changed my lifestyle, a lot of things changed. But I got a lot of pushback. So one of the questions that I get, um, and I, so I'm grateful for Grain Brain because you know a nurse saying it versus someone who does research on the brain, it really helps. It backs up that message. Um, but one of the questions I get um, and I'm going to give you two questions. One of okay. them is how much gluten can I actually get away with eating before it becomes a problem? Like, is it all or none? Is it black and white? That's one question. The other one is you're talking a lot about really cutting back significantly pretty much on all carbohydrates. Now for vegans, we have a very big vegan community. They tend to really go after the carbohydrates. I tend to tell them, make it more plant-based than anything else you know, and include some, some protein in there, even if it's plant-based protein. But what would you say to these people? Because they tend to fill that gap with carbs. Well, let's, since that, that part of the question or the second question is fresh in mind, uh, I would say that we've got to, like we do with fats, good fats, bad fats. We need to talk about carbohydrates in terms of good and bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by and large, the types of uh, carbohydrates that our ancestors were exposed to were not uh, high in freely available carbs, right. uh, rapidly digested, rapidly releasing of, sh of, of sugar, that these complex carbohydrates that are non-grain based, that are based upon fiber rich foods have added. Uh, I think that we've got to, it's a really good point that you raise. And that is, you know, we need to look at net carbs. We okay. need to look at, uh, you know, encouraging people to enrich their diets with foods that are going to give them fiber, right. and especially prebiotic fiber that don't offer any uh, caloric uh, right. content to your physiology, but certainly act as fuel and a, a source for uh, met metabolic pr uh, production on the so, basis of your bacteria. So if I could just give them that simple tip. So when you're looking at carbohydrates, what I often tell people is subtract the fiber. So the amount of fiber. Yeah, I think the notion of net carbs is, is right. actually very good. Okay. Uh, because, you know, a recent study came out really quite interesting. Uh, and it looked at risk for cardiovascular disease in the gluten-free community versus those who ate gluten. Add, uh, 
And what they found was there was actually an increased risk of, of cardiovascular disease in the people who went gluten-free. Uh, and, and the headlines were, ah, you gluten-free Gwyneth Paltrow people, look what you're doing to yourself because you need gluten because here's a study showing that the gluten-free community is a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. That's not what the study concluded. If you read the study, the author stated that people who go gluten-free tend to consume less fiber overall. And that's a big mistake. So right. I would say, I know where you're going with this, but the caveat here is gluten-free is good with the caveat that make sure you get enough fiber in your diet to nurture your microbiome so that your micro uh, my, uh, microbiota can nurture your gut lining so you can reduce gut permeability so you can have a better functioning immune system and less inflammation. Inflammation is the cornerstone right. of cardiovascular disease. So people cut out fiber, they increase inflammation by virtue of the fact that they don't nurture their gut bacteria, which is you know, what the authors concluded, but that's not what the mainstream press jumped on. They said, all oh, you gluten-free people see, you're killing yourself. Well, when you look at gluten-free packaged foods, they're terrible. It's oh, often God. terrible, right? They're just it's as bad like, as other processed foods. They're they're just they're processed foods. They're terrible, so they're full right. of starch. I would say that uh, you say look gluten-free packaged foods. So there's a great tip there. Most of your food should come unpackaged. Plants. What and does that mean? That means all the aisles in the grocery store are pretty much going to be uh, off the list. You right. know, I mean, Perimeter. certainly. You know, your coconut oil and stuff, yeah, but all the fruits and vegetables and hopefully grass-fed beef or fish are all going to be around the periphery of the grocery store, in the freezer case or just sitting on shelves. Right. And so what would you say about how much gluten you can get away with? Is it black and white or what is the amount you can get Tana, away that's with? A, that's a, um, not an easy question because, you know, it tends to lead people to the place of, everything in moderation. Right. And I will tell you that having just said those words, the hair is going up in the back I of my I know, head. me yeah. too. I, yeah. Because uh, there's a little bit of sniffing glue in right. a bag from time to time. It's little not bit a of lot, cocaine. it's in moderation. A and B, having what an affair. Having moderation. an affair in moderation, yeah, no. So uh, I think we do our very best. We stay as gluten-free as we possibly can. Do I have gluten in my diet sometimes? I bet that I do. But when I go to a someone's house, do I know what the ingredients are in the sauce that's going over the wild salmon? I don't know for sure, uh, but I do my best. So I'm not eating uh, wheat, barley, and rye. I'm doing my very best to avoid it. Um, so I think less is better. We want to do everything we can. The whole focus of the discussion is everything we can to maintain the integrity of the gut lining. And that's from me, a neurologist, that, right. it's, it's certainly a stretch. So I just yeah, want to emphasize- the neurologist is also a medical doctor. Well, and I want to emphasize that um, we're not talking about going and having cheat days of gluten and bread and <laughs> pasta and rice. So that's what I wanted to emphasize. But, but, but I have another question because there is also gluten in personal products. And That's right. cosmetics. So if you just think why women than men have a higher incidence, Perhaps. you just wonder if they're not also exposed to more toxins because you know what they spend on personal products is ten times what males spend. On per now, you look. Do you a whole see lot how long it takes us to get ready? Cuter than to I am, <laughs> but but you just wonder when I wrote Memory Rescue, I think the biggest takeaway for me is the impact of toxins on the brain and just how ubiquitous they are mm. in our personal products. Actually, we, you and I had breakfast and talked about that uh, a couple of years ago in Lo outside of Los Angeles, as I recall. Yep. Right, up in Westlake where we were speaking together. All right. Well, we have to stop this podcast. We are going to move on to the next one. So and you're going to be joining us again. Let's make sure. For okay. two more. And we're going to talk about toxins, gluten, and the glycemic index, what people need to know, um, which is sort of going to be a continuation of the discussion we're having. Stay with us.
Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Dr. David Perlmutter, the author of Grain Brain, Brain Maker, the Grain Brain Whole Life Plan. At the end of the year, he's going to have a revised version of Grain Brain, but don't wait. It's a great <laughs> book. It's easy to read. It will help you change your behavior. You know, I tell people, um, my experience, people change in one of three ways. Mm -hmm. They get an epiphany. And if you see your brain scan, you get an epiphany. It's like, wow, that's not great. I need to do better. Um, they change the people they hang out with uh, because you become like the people you spend time with. Or they make small incremental changes, what our friend BJ Fogg terms tiny habits. Wow. Um, a grain brain for so many of my patients was an epiphany. Right. It's like, I had no idea this could hurt me. If I love myself, in fact, I had this 76-year-old guy in my office yesterday who I evaluated, he has memory problems. And when I'm telling him what the things I want him to do, he said, I'm gonna do it 100% because I love myself. And I, I love that. Um, he had trouble loving himself around the whole sugar. Right. And, you know, because he's got diabetes. You wanna pick and choose, right. Right, but... Uh, you know, the sad thing is I, in our society, um, I think something that our friend Dr. Or, uh, Pastor Rick Warren says is also true. People don't change when they see the light, they change when they feel the heat. And so um, we want to make sure that people get that balance. They want, we want hope, the light, but we want to know that there, we want them to know there's heat on the other side because it is, there is, and that's a fact. So we want that balance. So welcome with us again. And I'm delighted to be here. You guys are the best. Well, thank you so much. Um, the glycemic index. It's confusing to and people. And the glycemic load. Um, when I first learned about it, I went, oh, this is smart because from a psychiatrist standpoint, and we do imaging, we have found the higher a person's blood sugar, um, the smaller their brain. Right. And there's actually imaging studies saying the hippocampus becomes smaller, um, diabetes became very personal. It's actually personal to both of very us. Very personal. Uh, my father-in-law, when he was 55, was diagnosed with diabetes. He was also an alcoholic. He's very abusive to his family. And, and he just never got it. He, he just, you know, the doctor would say, stay away from sugar. He was clearly addicted to donuts and simple carbohydrates and ended up losing his eyesight, his legs, his heart, uh, my died with dementia. My grandmother also. Um, but how do we make the glycemic index simple for our listeners, for our community? Because that confuses people. I mean, telling them to stay away from sugar, they understand what that means, but they don't really understand how to interpret the glycemic index most of the time. Well, let me take you back, and we're going to go to the University of Toronto where the glycemic index was created. And it was created as a way of working with diabetics, strangely, by looking at their diets, who knew? Uh, as if the <laughs> diet had some role to play in terms of blood sugar. And we wanted to rank foods in terms of how they would affect blood sugar over a 90 minute period of time. And they used, they created this term, uh, the glycemic index to assess what was the impact of, uh, of various food choices. And then they applied that. Uh, and then various institutions started to republish their information and it became uh, very handy. Uh, we still use glycemic index and glycemic load right. that takes this information a bit further by applying the notion of what a typical person would consider a portion of a food in terms of its effect on blood sugar. The bottom line is that both of these indices look at how much uh, how aggressive will your blood sugar rise be uh, if you consume either a standard portion of a, a type of food or if the portions are all the same in terms of the glycemic index. So it's important to understand it's not just the height that your blood sugar goes during the 90 minute period as in the case of the glycemic index, but it's more the area under the curve, meaning it's not just that it suddenly spiked, but did it remain elevated for that 90 minute period of time so that more of that 90 minute was taken up by having higher blood sugar because that means the blood sugar is higher and damaging for a longer period of time. And it was interesting to note uh, in the early studies uh, that foods that people thought were really good for them 
turned out not to be. That whole grain, whole wheat bread had a dramatically high glycemic index, even higher than white, highly processed bread. And that uh, things uh, like a Snickers bar that everybody would think would be about the worst food that you could eat had about half the glycemic index as bread. And that became, you know, raised a lot of eyebrows because it sort of began uh, challenging our notion of what made for good versus bad choices in the diabetic. Well, since that time, many of us have adopted these lists and parameters and findings for people who aren't diabetic and don't want to become diabetic because we know diabetes is devastating for the brain. So in our writings, like Grain Brain, we applied glycemic index information uh, to our recipes and actually provided the glycemic index to our readers so that they could make informed choices long before they had uh, diabetes as a preventive medicine approach to keeping their brains healthy, keeping their blood sugars low. So this is why this information is so valuable. And I will tell you that it's a good thing to review this from time to time because there are always some really interesting surprises on, on the glycemic index list. So things like bread, pasta, potatoes, white potatoes, rice, even brown rice right. are as high as table sugar. So let's talk about what number they should stay under. That's what confuses people. Well, how do I know well, what's it's, bad it's and what's good? It's a good question. It, it really depends on how much of that food you are consuming. Um, the glycemic index of an egg is zero. So that doesn't mean you, can, you should go out and eat 10 eggs because you'd, you'd have no spike in your blood sugar. But I think that we want to try to choose foods that have a glycemic index in the 50s or perhaps uh, mid 50s and lower if you're eating a typical meal, uh, typical portions. So you really want to strive to have those lower glycemic index foods. But it doesn't mean that, again, just because a food has a glycemic index of 50, you can eat all you want. You really have to practice moderation in that regard. And the, the beauty here is that it helps us delineate between carbs and effect on blood sugar. So you can have low glycemic index foods that have quite a bit of carbohydrates because it's fiber. Carbohydrates are what makes up fiber. These are low, low glycemic index foods, the, though they have carbohydrates in them, you can eat those in abundance and it's good for you. Especially anything green. <laughs> well, especially well, anything colorful. I like green, right. but so, I also like um, color. I like right. a variety of colors. You wanna really cover the bases. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the real beauty of greens, especially with uh, some of the information that people are exploring these days, is greens are high in folate. Now, right. That's where the term folate comes from, foliage. And, you know, these days people seem to think, well, I need to take a, a, a really strong B complex with a lot of folic acid. It turns out that folic acid is not a good choice. Folic acid can bind those folate receptors, which are important. Uh, and compete uh, negatively with natural sources of folate. And this isn't necessarily a good thing, especially, and I think I'm probably gonna go off topic here for a moment, but if you'll allow me, we understand these days that the reason we need folate and it's really critically important is because folate helps us with a very complicated process called methylation. Mm -hmm. Methylation is involved in things like detoxification preventing damage to our DNA. So that's obviously a good thing to have going for you. Folate, uh, when it becomes methylated, is able to participate in this life important process of protecting our DNA, kind of important. We know that about 20 to 25% of Americans harbor uh, a genetic variation that doesn't allow them to activate this folate in such a way so that they are at risk for genetic damage and problems with detoxification because they can't activate the folate, even the folate they consume that comes from uh, vegetables and uh, green vegetables, for example. We call this situation uh, MTHFR. And many of your viewers have never heard of that term, but I would urge them to look at some YouTube videos on what is called MTHFR. It stands for uh, an enzyme that activates folate and allows you then to protect your DNA, detoxification, et cetera. So 
That's the kind of information you can get from having your genome sequence, like 23andMe. Now, 23andMe doesn't give you that information. They will give you your entire genome sequence. You just take that information, you go to one of various other websites, you email them uh, that information, in five minutes you get back all of these cool pathways. And if you are like I am, uh, you might have a defect in MTHFR, great. Now you know this information, you're empowered. What do I have to do? I have to take a supplement that has methylfolate in it every day, and I'm doing the right thing to protect my DNA. So, you know, there's a, the movement in a paleo is to eat like our ancestors. I think it's terrific. Uh, I think we should avoid sugars, et cetera. But I also think it's really exciting to apply leading edge technology and understanding who we are as individuals right. and what our individuals uh, individual needs might be and how we can cater that, to that based upon these higher levels of knowledge that we're now able to obtain. Agree. So we always talk about you can't change what you don't measure. So knowing your important numbers is critical. And Yes, and it brings and up the notion of genes versus environment. We can't change our genes, genes but we can certainly uh, change how we influence our, our genes so that some would say that, uh, you know, our DNA loads the gun and our environment pulls the trigger. Right. So these things might not manifest if we make certain changes. We're never going to know unless you look. So my daughter is pregnant and she will have Haven, our fifth grandbaby, in June. And what, when I lecture, I talk about how little girls, when they're born, they're born with all of the eggs they'll ever have and the mother's behavior is turning on or off certain genes that make illness more or less likely in Haven, but also in Haven's, grand, in Haven's babies. Um, so this is serious stuff. And I think the most exciting part of genetics for me is this whole notion of epigenetics, mm -hmm. that I can turn on or off certain genes that really help me be healthy or sick. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's, it's, it's sobering when you think of how important this is and when we're sending so many children through fast food lines to get food, or we've just sort of adopted our two nieces and you hear about what they serve at school. School's, school it's, lunches we're are We're promoting illness rather than promoting health. Yeah. Well, that's right. And I think this whole notion that we control to a significant degree, our genetic expression, wow. Uh, you know, that, that kind of goes against uh, our medical education, certainly. And it is uh, empowering, but it does uh, connote a significant degree of responsibility yeah. now. That my lifestyle choices will change either for the positive or the negative, my gene expression. And it's been estimated that about 70% of DNA that codes for health and longevity is under our control to some degree. Um, I was very taken recently uh, in January of this year, 2018, January the 16th, in the, the journal Neurology, they offered up practice guidelines about what we should, as neurologists, should do with respect to a patient who has what is called mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. which is sort of on the continuum to becoming a demented person. So it's when not only the patient thinks that he or she has an issue, but the testing starts to show that there are some problems in how their brain is working, but they're not yet full-blown dementia. What do you tell that patient? And uh, these are 2018 guidelines, and they went through the list of all the possible things that we could or perhaps should do. They went through an entire page of medications that uh, could be perhaps prescribed, and they didn't validate a single one. They indicated that not one medication was reasonable to prescribe. And in fact, the only medication that has been demonstrated to reduce the risk of becoming an Alzheimer's patient if you have mild cognitive impairment is an, a medication called exercise. <laughs> and <laughs> you could put it on a prescription pad. Uh, exercise is the only thing the Green Journal of Neurology put out by the American Academy of Neurology is telling us as neurologists, we should be telling MCI patients that they should take or do. 
uh, to reduce their risk of becoming an Alzheimer's patient. Wow. And the reason that uh, we'll segue back to our conversation is that exercise is one of the most powerful epigenetic events that we can engage. Exercise changes the expression of our genome, specifically amplifying a pathway that leads to a chemical called BDNF that makes the brain grow new brain cells and will work against what Dr. Amen described earlier, and that is the shrinkage of the hippocampus that we don't want. We don't want our memory centers to shrink. You were correlating that with blood sugar. Now we know we can unwind that and yep. we can reverse that with physical exercise and repopulate the brain's memory center by turning on a set of genes. I think that's very empowering. So two awesome. really important uh, takeaways from this podcast. Exercise can change your genes. It's something all of us should do every day. I wear my little Fitbit just because it reminds me. It's a biofeedback device. Go to bed and get 10,000 steps. Um, and then the glycemic index. And whenever you have a question about a food, just Google glycemic index of apples, right. glycemic index of white rice, glycemic index of whatever you're going to choose. And as Dr. Perlmutter said, try to stay 55 or under. And just because Snickers, which is 55, um, don't go for the Snickers, <laughs> right? I mean, you have to use your thought. There's no nutritional you, you, you know, value. Um, Einstein said you God gave what? you a big I'm brain tell for you, reason. Uh, so I've long puzzled about the Snickers bar, not that I eat them, but it contains a lot of nuts. Nuts. It's because of the nuts, but and there's not a lot of nutritional of calories, value there. But so. it's fat. Yeah. No, I, I, knew, I knew right away where, where you're going with that. But um, one thing I wanted to just throw in there. Okay, we have to uh, get on to Brainmaker, which I'm so excited to talk about because we've been talking about it. So do you have a quick question? No, no, no. And it, it was just to confirm the exercise thing. I went and saw my cardiologist who is very, very big into nutrition. And he, I was so surprised that he actually confirmed what you said. He said, as much as I believe in nutrition and lifestyle for improving heart function, he said all of the recent studies are showing that exercise is actually more important, which is hard for me to say. So it was really interesting because of the BDNF. So can I just thought that was uh, fascinating. Can I just mention one more interesting study that I think is really compelling? Do we have time for that? We do. So this appeared in the journal Neurology in April of 2017. And it looked at individuals who carried uh, ge the genetic predisposition. The, the, I hate to call them Alzheimer's genes, but things like APOE4, mm -hmm. CLU, and something called ABCA7. And these genes, if you carry them, are associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's. And um, they're all involved, interestingly, in cholesterol metabolism. But aside from that, what we've known for a long time is that carrying one or more of these genes, uh, there are markers that you can measure in the spinal fluid, like beta amyloid and something called phosphorylated tau protein. If you have the genes, you're gonna have higher levels of those Alzheimer's related proteins, beta amyloid and phosphorylated tau. So there's a correlation between the gene profile and these markers that are measurable in the spinal fluid. And what they found and published was that if you had those uh, markers, those gene uh, risks, but you had a high level of cardiorespiratory fitness, then the markers in the spinal fluid were lower. So you have the genetic risk, but you've made a lifestyle change and are exercising more, the play out in the spinal fluid was less beta amyloid and less phosphorylated tau, which we know are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So again, it, it's a stunning uh, article in that it really takes us away from this genetic determinism mm -hmm. uh, model that says, if you have this, you're basically in deep trouble and there's nothing right. you can do. Uh, au contraire. Well, and then the other thing that that brings up is almost all of the pharmaceuticals or get pharmaceutical companies are getting out of the Alzheimer's business because they're not finding that silver bullet that really will make a difference, that it's lifestyle that matters uh, way more than you can take this pill or that. And pill. you can't patent that. Mm -hmm. So uh, my friend uh, Dale Bredesen has said that it's not silver bullets that we should be looking for, it's silver buckshot. 
I was just going to say it's a shotgun. <laughs> I was just going to say that. You have to fight the war on multiple fronts. As many modalities as you possibly can, because yeah. Alzheimer's doesn't happen from one event or one gene or one blow to the head or right. one uh, choice in yeah. terms of gender or education or uh, heritage. Yeah, I'll take uh, my chance with shotgun. Multiple things conspire. <laughs> and you don't get out of that situation uh, unless you look at uh, unpacking many approaches uh, to, uh, and that's what Dr. Bredesen has demonstrated to be effective in reversing Alzheimer's disease. Right. We're so excited about it. When we come back, we're going to talk about BrainMaker and the gut-brain connection. Stay with us. Love that. We are back with our friend, Dr. Perlmutter, and I love this episode because we're going to talk about what you can eat and what you should not eat to help your brain. So Brain Maker, the whole life program. Um, and of course, for me, this is, this is my forte. This is my specialty. So I love this. So welcome back, Dr. Perlmutter. And we're also going to talk about the microbiome. Yes. And so how does a neurologist <laughs> get interested in the gut? Bugs. Bugs in the gut. <laughs> yeah, what's a good guy like you doing in the gut? Well, um, many years, several years ago, uh, you know, in uh, going to see patients day in and day out and not having, again, many tools in the toolbox, we began to see a, a couple of dots come together. That is, number one, we began understanding that Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disorder, as is autism, Parkinson's, MS, uh, depression. And at the same time, the literature began to be very clear in terms of the relationship of the gut bacteria to inflammation. So connecting those dots, I thought, well, maybe there are some answers here in terms of what we can do for the brain by looking at what goes on in the gut. And uh, that is the, the genesis of, of the exploration and ultimately the manifestation uh, that went behind the creation of the book Brain Maker, the relationship of the gut to the brain. Having said that, you know, I, I would indicate that to this day, most of my neurology colleagues don't really want to go to that place or recognize anything really below the frame and magnum as having any relevance in terms of the brain. Uh, but the, the, the literature now is, is expanding dramatically and in research institutions around the world uh, there is no book yet about the microbiome and the brain for professionals. I'm, in, uh, I'm the editor of a book that has that as the title that'll be out in 2019, where we've collected authors from around the world to write various uh, chapters for both researchers and clinicians. So again, getting back to the connection, if inflammation is the cornerstone mechanism and the gut bacteria are involved in that through many ways that we can discuss, then the gut bacteria are important and that makes food important because their health and their ability to do all the great things that they are doing to keep you alive really depends upon what they eat and they eat what you eat. I tell my patients, you know, we've said for years that women when they're pregnant have to be careful because now you're eating for two. Everyone has to be careful because we're each eating for a hundred trillion. Right. They eat what you eat. Right. And uh, when we make inappropriate choices, foods high in sugar, devoid of fiber, foods that contain uh, additives and various things that can prove toxic. Uh, when they take medications, for example, uh, antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors that are used to, to reduce stomach acid, commonly used non-steroid anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. These are factors that can damage the gut bacteria mm -hmm. and can enhance inflammation can enhance risk for obesity, can enhance risk for diabetes. So those are the types of broad strokes that go into the idea that our food choices and other lifestyle choices are very relevant, looked at through the lens of our gut bacterial friends. I, I love something that you said, and I applaud you for this, because as somebody who spent many years being very sick, um, you know, you said that many of your friends don't want to look at anything below the brain. I'll just make that simple for our listeners. Below the brain as being relevant to the brain. 
And that's really frustrating to someone who ended up on nine medications because of that philosophy. So everyone was sort of disconnected and not looking at how everything was affecting everything else. And as somebody who had thyroid cancer and multiple surgeries and treatments, you know, when your thyroid's messed up, it affects everything in your life. And, and as a result, other things began to go wrong and everyone just was throwing medications at me. And that's not really fair to the patient to think that way. So when it's your so thyroid's true. messed up, you're depressed and that affects your brain. So. Well, you know, I, I use you all the time because you do. That's I'm why I married yes, you. Besides, for the stories. you're beautiful and smart. You're just full of stories. L let's go back to how the microbiome actually becomes populated initially. Right. Because, um, you know, when you're initially conceived, you don't have a microbiome, right? I mean, there's an egg and a sperm ultimately the microbiome becomes populated over time. Um, and I remember in reading uh, Brain Maker, um, you know, there's a difference between babies that were um, C-section yeah. and, and babies who were breastfed uh, and the health. And natural birth. And then early childhood traumas can actually change the microbiome. And when Tana was four, so she grew up in a fairly chaotic home. Yeah, my entire, like early from birth. <laughs> her uncle was a crazy. drug dealer and uh, a drug addict. And her one of her first memories is witnessing her mother and her grandmother screaming, falling to the floor when they found out her uncle had been murdered in a drug deal. Shortly thereafter, she begins going to the doctor a lot for upper and lower GIs. And she's like, do you think any of that's related? And No, I actually didn't think it was. You're the one who looked at me and you're like, you don't think that's related? <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk to us about how it develops and what keeps it healthy and what sure. hurts. Well, let me just not let that uh, in, an anecdote uh, go unnoticed. And because we talk about the gut-brain connection a lot, but I think what you're referring to here is the brain-gut connection. And the, the idea uh, that uh, brain-related events like emotional trauma, for example, uh, might manifest uh, in the gut. And it's true, it does. So that when we experience trauma, for example, ongoing trauma or repeated trauma, et cetera, or an event of acute trauma, we know that the various uh, changes in chemistry within the body affect the microbiome. Cortisol, for example, uh, has a powerful effect on changing uh, the uh, array of organisms that live in the gut, amplifies production of uh, certain uh, yeast species, for example, and changes the uh, the balance between various organisms and is associated with increased leakiness or permeability of the gut. We know that that persistent elevation of cortisol has an effect, damaging effect on the brain cells that live in the hippocampus, the memory center, which are also involved in regulation of mood. So uh, I, I just think, uh, as and for just a moment, the notion that brain events can ultimately lead to inflammation, the cornerstone of depression, uh, is worth stating. So let me get back to the genesis then of the, of the gut bacteria and other organisms that live in the gut. We realize now that, you know, we, as you mentioned, a lot of importance has been placed on how a child is born, vaginally versus through cesarean section. But we now understand that there is a colonization of the intestines uh, of the developing fetus as well, that the placenta is not sterile, that there are organisms living within the placenta that there are organisms living within the brain, uh, that you know, we have to revise our concept about uh, areas of the body that we had previously thought were sterile, uh, anything but the truth. Uh, and it's very important to understand that those organisms actually influence our gene expression in these various areas and throughout our bodies. That's a heady concept that are the bugs, the microbes living upon us and within us are influencing our own genome expression. So we inherit uh, uh, top down, vertical uh, inheritance is the DNA that came from those people who came before us. Our ancestors, th their DNA was passed down to us. We say it was passed down to us, maybe passed up to us, but in one way or another, it's vertical. But we also inherit information 
horizontally or transversely, meaning that as you mentioned, at the time we are born, we get a lot of genetic information. We get information in the DNA of the various bacteria that live in the vaginal birth canal that mother transmits to us. This is information that informs this brand new baby about his environment, about her dietary uh, availability, her caloric availability or scarcity. It gives that new child a snapshot of what his or her world is going to be like and preps that child for that world to come. And as a matter of fact, the amount of, of DNA uh, that that child receives through this mechanism far exceeds the, you know, the, the 23 uh, genome that we receive uh, from parental uh, inheritance. So we receive a heck of a download at the time we are born. I like to think of it in terms of you bought a new computer. That's what you got from mom and dad. They gave you a new computer. But at the time of birth, we load the apps. And the apps are up to date and give us really good information about what now, how we can perform, how we function using uh, the, the template that mother and dad gave us. So uh, Dr. Amen, you are correct that uh, this does have implication in terms of health of that child and the adult that that child becomes that being born by cesarean section, uh, by virtue of the fact that you were deprived of that information download because you didn't go through the gates, you didn't get that package of information by being vaginally birthed, birthed you get bacteria that's in the operating room uh, and bacteria that's on the surgeon's gown. And at the same time, uh, mother has been blasted with antibiotics as well. So if she chooses to breastfeed, uh, that that child will further be compromised in terms of his or her microbiome by virtue of the fact that the skin bacteria on mother's breast will change and the breast milk will change as well by virtue of the fact that mom got that uh, antibiotic. So this may well explain why C-section children uh, have a much higher risk of autism, ADHD, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, adult obesity, and even some mood issues moving forward, certainly uh, allergies and asthma as well. I want to make one very important point, and that is that C-sections are important. They are valuable. They save lives. So I'm not mommy bashing here, but I am saying to any of your viewers who moving forward are going to have a baby that there's more to the discussion, should we or should we not have a C-section, than simply how big will the scar be? That the choice for C-section uh, has to be looked at in terms of its potential downsides in terms of that child not developing an appropriate microbiome that is most salubrious, most uh, involved in giving health. So, And if you it, choose for whatever reason, or you have to have a C-section, then finding other ways to populate the gut. Right, like I gave Chloe um, probiotics early in life because I had to have a C-section. I had to have an emergency C-section. So some of us have yes, to do and that. There is reason so, that, and God bless the fact that right. uh, we have emergency c section So your baby's here and you're here to have right. our discussion today. Wouldn't right. it happen? Right, right? exactly. So, and so I don't feel guilty but, but for that. But do OBGYN doctors sort of get this? Mine did. Um, no. I, don't, I mean, I'm not going to say categorically no, because I think, you know, certainly, but I think by and large, this isn't part of the discussion. Now, My, mine actually I mean, did. Mine actually was, was told me that you should absolutely try to have a vaginal birth. There's reasons that child is supposed to go through the birth canal. So she was pretty savvy. I don't know right, if all but, of them are that way. But since you had the C-section, did she say, we need to figure out how no. in a healthy way to populate this baby's no. microbiome? No. Well, let me tell you, no one has the answer for that in specific, but uh, Dr. Maria Dominguez Bello at NYU has pioneered the research and the idea that, you know, you're going to have a C-section. What do we do? Well, just prior to C-section, a surgical sponge, a moist surgical sponge is placed in the birth canal to oh. harvest this information in the form of the bacteria. That's so interesting. Then it's put in a warm, moist environment. You have your baby. And then the baby is totally inoculated over his or her face, what? into the mouth, into the nose, with mother's vaginal birth canal bacteria. That's Sounds cool. so interesting. Uh, her more recent research published in the journal Nature has demonstrated that there is recoverability of mother's organisms that are DNA sequenced 
in that child's poop as much as six months after birth. So I think we're just beginning to understand that. Uh, but I think that ideology, I think, is going to be explored uh, much more aggressively because I think it makes a lot of sense. That's so cool. And I'm That's curious, so um, and maybe it's too long for this podcast, and I would love to have you back if it is. Um, but but what about traumatic births? So, so a child is born vaginally, but they're born breech, or they have had to you know, use forceps. Are they still better off being born vaginally and receiving that download, or is the download interrupted? Uh, I, I think it'd be very difficult to weigh those one against the other uh, because one doesn't know how you characterize uh, trauma. I mean, as uh, your husband would indicate in, in terms of athletes, you know, that there is uh, everything from none to catastrophic. Right. Uh, how yeah. long was the child hypoxic? What force it's used? What were the, you know, the decelerations of the heart looking like, sure. et cetera? Uh, so I think it, these are you know, these are not necessarily comparable. I think that within reason, women should have a vaginal uh, birth whenever possible. The notion that 33% of the births performed in America today uh, are, are C-section births is, wow. is a little uh, difficult to embrace when uh, the World Health Organization has indicated that about 10 to 15% of births in America might be so distressed that they would require a c-section so what that means is that c-sections are being performed for other reasons right i don't know what are, we can speculate what those reasons are but we'll leave it at that uh, the the point is though that this event of birth is uh hugely important in terms of the information download that happens at that time well i'm also a child psychiatrist so we have tens of thousands of children's brains and you know i often say the day you are born is one of the most dangerous <laughs> days of your life. So we see birth trauma, force of deliveries, breech babies, Anoxia, yeah. and we can see damage years later. Uh, so it's 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 critical to make the most thoughtful, careful decision that you can. But but let let's talk about you, you have kids or you're an adult. What is the right diet and what are the right supplements to take to try to optimize your microbiome? And for and everybody, I healthy. just recommend you read Brain Maker. Um, it's, it's just, it's fascinating, it's easy, um, and you will never again look at food the same way. Mm -hmm. Or your poop, you will never look at your poop the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen too often. Right, I was like, what? that implies they're looking at their poop. <laughs> what is it? It's like 60% of it is dead bacteria. So. And you know what? Everybody looks at their poop. <laughs> they, you right? said, I mean, I'm a nurse. Does. I had to look at everybody's poop. I think that's poop. a good thing because then right. you're able to see if things have changed. Yeah, I had to chart um, the size, the color, the shape, the, you know, everything for everybody. So, you know, absolutely. I'm a nurse. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's not a reasonable thing to do. Um, and I, I want to answer that question in two ways. First, from the notion that we, I believe, understand what are called the broad strokes. And second, that we live in a time when we're embracing the notion of personalized medicine. In other words, beyond what the broad strokes are, what are the variations based upon an individual that are important as well? First, let's look at the broad strokes. By far and away, what is critically important for the health of the microbiota living within us is that they receive adequate amounts of prebiotic fiber. Everybody knows fiber is important, but there's a unique type of fiber called prebiotic fiber. Prebiotic nurtures the probiotic. Mm -hmm. This is the type of fiber that our good bacteria can use to reproduce themselves, but more importantly, to um, do their processes of metabolism to make the chemicals that they make that are really important for us. B so, vitamin, uh, vitamin K, B12, uh, to make short chain fatty acids, to heal the gut lining. So prebiotic rich foods are things like jicama, which is Mexican yam, dandelion greens, garlic, onions, leeks, chicory root, and really pretty much a lot of fruits and vegetables. We've known that that's a good diet for a long time. And here's yet another reason that your plate should be colorful, and mostly filled with uh, fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables, if you're, if you're considering the sugar content. And I think that's very important. 
I think that uh, it's very important that we welcome fat back to the table. Uh, you know, we've gone through about a four decade period of time of fat phobia, which was unlike any diet humans have ever consumed as long as we've been walking this planet. Uh, it was brought on us <clears throat> by interests who didn't have our health in mind, uh, simply to get us on higher levels of shelf stable carbohydrates and lower levels of fat with the mistaken notion that fat was damaging to our bodies and that if we ate a lot of it, then all of our children were gonna be born naked or some crazy thing would happen. Uh, but, but that said, to be clear, good fat. We're talking about unmodified, healthful fat, the extra virgin olive oil, um, the avocados, avocado oil, nuts and seeds, wild uh, fish, uh, uh, grass-fed beef, et cetera, good sources of good fat. That doesn't mean all fats are good. Certain fats are, in fact, damaging to health. Those shelf-stable vegetable oils, safflower oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, et cetera, most of which is genetically modified, and that carries its, uh, yet another level of baggage. So fat is important, fiber is important, and minimizing those foods that are going to spike our, our blood sugar. So simple carbohydrates need to be avoided. It doesn't matter if it's uh, maple sugar from the most sacred right. maple tree in Northern Canada or honey that comes from bees that live on an ashram and meditate three <laughs> times a day. It doesn't matter. Your body sees that and says sugar. Right. So <laughs> I love that. And it's getting a kick out of this. Well, because I, I get this, I get that all the time from people, but it's, but it's wholesome. It's Organic. pure, it's clean. And but it's, it's natural. Free. Yeah. Arsenic is natural. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so plutonium, there you go. Right. Uh, but uh, that said, so that's the basics. Then I think we move to a place of what we want to avoid. And let's talk about the broad strokes there as well. If we're castigating, and I think rightfully, sugar uh, in our media and in our books we write, et cetera, then it tends to give a message that then sugar-free is the way to go. Well, yeah, sugar-free is the way to go, but that doesn't open the door to artificial sweetness. Right. And that's unfortunately where the media is taking us. If you, know, you watch TV, there is this zero and something that's sugar-free. And, and what we now understand is that there are dramatic changes that happen to the gut bacteria mm -hmm. when they are exposed to things like aspartame. Mm -hmm. Aspartame is directly toxic to the gut bacteria. And it's why we see, paradoxically, that those individuals who are drinking one or more cans of a diet drink every day have a dramatic as much as twofold increased risk for diabetes and obesity mm -hmm. in comparison to those who are drinking sugar sweetened beverages. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying drink the sugar sweetened beverage, but it's very, very misguided. If you think you're drinking diet XYZ because it's gonna help you lose weight, it does exactly the opposite. Right. It puts your microbiome, your gut yeah. bacteria, in a state of wanting to harvest every possible calorie from your food that they can. Your body thinks it's starving and as such accumulates calories and you get fat. Yeah, I and actually read one study um, that said that sucralose actually could decrease your good gut bacteria by 50%. Is that accurate? It's quite dramatic. And it's, it's why uh, we see these correlations with things like diabetes, other inflammatory right. disorders, and obesity. It's, uh, it's why we see researchers in Amsterdam, for example, uh, one fellow that I recently saw present at, uh, at Harvard talk about doing fecal transplants and reversing type 2 diabetes. Wow. Uh, so, wow. you know, that's a, certainly an extreme approach. I would say that in our society, the other important issue that needs to be vetted, and that is the effect upon the gut bacteria of the commonly used medications like over-the-counter acid-blocking drugs. Mm -hmm. Severe effect on the uh, microbiome, uh, which might explain why chronic users of these so-called proton pump inhibitors may have as much as a 40% increased risk for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. And that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We gotta scream this information out to the world because it's really important. People think if they don't tolerate the sausage sandwich, as the commercial would lead you to believe, that if they just suppress their stomach acid and they can then eat the sausage sandwich, everything is good. Well, when you change the pH of the gut, starting at yeah. the stomach, you're going to change the pH of the intestines, where the bacteria live. 
you will select out some populations to overgrow and you will suppress populations of other potentially good bacteria. It explains why, for example, taking these acid blocking drugs is associated with overgrowth of something called Clostridia difficile, which causes what's called C. diff and kills 40,000 Americans a year yeah. from, from diarrhea that cannot be controlled. This is information that's very important. We know that taking antibiotics is strongly associated, like artificial sweeteners, with increased risk for diabetes. And I think that's information that people need to get. The non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs impart significant changes on the microbiome mm -hmm. as well. You don't see that talked about on the evening news when people are told, hey, uh, you know, you have an upset stomach, take this acid blocking drug, or your joint hurts, take uh, some ibuprofen. But yet we need to practice under the doctrine of above all do no harm as physicians but unfortunately, that doesn't seem to extend to the manufacturers of these drugs. Yeah. So what about um, people who have Lyme, so more and more common, more and more commonly diagnosed, who end up on long-term antibiotics? And it's a huge, a, a huge issue. And I think that uh, Dr. Richard Horowitz, how do you like the way I'm ready for this one, in his <laughs> wonderful book, called Why Can't I Get Better? And more importantly, what to do about it. Or rather, Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Disease. Uh, so really I've terrific. read that. It's a wonderful Pretty thick book. Too. Yeah. Uh, looks at that and looks at the idea of um, you know, supplementing with probiotics. And I think beyond that, in this day and age, we should absolutely be looking at the idea of fecal mm -hmm. microbial transplant uh, in individuals who by necessity have to take right. antibiotics even for a fairly short period of time. Now, I'm not saying everybody who takes an antibiotic because of an event of pneumonia needs a fecal transplant. But as you, and the reason you asked the question is, you know, these individuals with chronic Lyme disease are on months and months of, or if not years of antibiotics right. and are really uh, imparting a dramatic change upon their microbiome. You know, maybe it's the nurse in me or maybe it's coming from somebody who's been sick. And I, you mentioned that, you know, the fecal transplant sounds like an extreme um, an extreme way to handle something like type 2 diabetes or some of these issues. But, and, and yet maybe it's, maybe it's because it sounds gross to people. Let's just be honest. But to me, it doesn't sound that extreme when you talk about losing your eyesight, your legs, um, you know, your heart function and dying um, and your overall quality of life. It doesn't sound that extreme if the answer is that your gut is affected because of something that happened to you. I think they're also in, they're in, animal studies, aren't they using it as an anti-aging intervention as well from young mice to older mice and show an, an improvement. But um, in the few minutes we have left, <laughs> what are probiotic foods and supplements that you recommend? I know this is an interest, an area of interest for you. Well, there are a lot of foods that are fermented and are just teeming with great organisms. One of them, which is my favorite, is kimchi. Mm, me too. And gosh, there is a lot of research appearing that looks at kimchi uh, in terms of how healthful it is. You're going uh, you to have to get used to Kimchi is really a staple. And oh, you must like kimchi. I do. In Korea. She does. I hate it. Oh, well, I trained in good, Hawaii it, where there's a large Korean population. And so we used to go to a Korean restaurant every Friday as a, as a group of psychiatrists. And I just could never get used to it. But I love sauerkraut. Well, there you go. And, um, you know, to take a step back, why are uh, virtually all general uh, large cultures in the world, cultures, interesting word, uh, <laughs> involved in this fermentation right. of one sort or another? And it's because it's a way of preserving food. When right. food is fermented, it lasts a heck of a lot longer. You know, in the days prior to uh, refrigeration, that sure. was always a challenge. So it's, you know, what went into creating things like yogurt and kimchi and kombucha and cheese and certainly uh, wine and beer as well. These are fermented foods. So, uh, but the, the data looking at things like kimchi is really very, very exciting. So uh, foods that are fermented, as some of that I've mentioned, uh, Kefir is certainly very right. popular these days, and a lot of people are drinking kombucha. 
I'd say, you know, the easiest thing to do is to make this stuff at home. It's, I can do it. It's not that hard. Um, beyond that, of course, there are uh, commercially available health food store kinds of probiotics. And I think as we move forward, we're sort of seeing that the, uh, there are good products and products that are not so good. And then, you know, briefly, I'd say that you want to look for a product that has a long shelf life, long right. stability, meaning that if this product says it has 50 billion organisms, it shouldn't be a product that says 50 billion organisms at the time of manufacture. That's all well and good. But if, you know, three weeks after it was shipped and two weeks after you get it home, it has only half that amount, it's not going to do you that much good. You want to look for a product that's going to give you a couple of years of guaranteeing that level of organism. You want to find a lot of diversity in the species. So we typically look for 12, 14 or so different organisms that are clinically validated to be positive in terms of your health. So those are the issues that we want to look for in terms of buying a, uh, a probiotic. We want to see one that's obviously non-GMO as well. And at the same time, we want to nurture those bacteria. We talked about prebiotic fiber. That's the fiber that you eat in terms of these vegetables that then gives these bacteria what they need. The good news is uh, that uh, if you don't like kimchi, you can buy a probiotic pill. If you're not eating enough prebiotic fiber, you go to the health food store and say, I want some prebiotic fiber, and they will direct you. And then you'll find a bag of fiber that you can mix into your morning drink. Uh, and that is pure prebiotic fiber. The best product out, out there, uh, which is again, what you want to look for, I think, uh, is made from acacia gum. Acacia mm -hmm. is this tree in Africa, you know, the tall canopy tree where the uh, giraffe gets uh, the shade and the sun and the heat. And that tree secretes a resin that is called acacia gum and it is sustainably harvested it is organic and it's pulverized made into a powder and it's the best in my opinion prebiotic fiber that there is and very well tolerated so you can you can go to the health food store and, and say that's what you want uh, those are very important considerations and i think in moving forward uh that we're going to see a lot more emphasis hopefully even in terms of, of ingredients labeling moving forward in terms of prebiotic fiber. Very, very underrated, but hugely important. So helpful. You know, it has just been a joy to be with you yes. again. And we'll have you back on again. Um, everybody should know that Dr. Perlmutter has his own podcast that I listen to uh, or watch regularly. Yeah. How, how, can people, in. how can people learn more about your books and your educational events and materials? Sure. Uh, my website is, oddly enough, drperlmutter.com. <laughs> drperlmutter.com. Uh, our website, as you know, is uh, very enriched with not just my blogs, but in my blogs, I talk about a scientific study. We hyperlink right to it. So we have a robust library of full, not just the abstract, PDFs of all the studies that I quote, and I'd like uh, your listeners to sign up for our weekly newsletter. I put it out every week, uh, and they can watch our, our podcast comes out every Sunday. Of course, it's virtual. You can watch it whenever you want. Uh, and I enjoy doing that. Uh, I get to interview brilliant people like yourselves, and I'm sure you've enjoyed your podcast. I mean, it's, a, it's such a great experience, and you get all these books that people send you to read. I mean, how can you do that? <laughs> it's great, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, my friend. Thank I look you forward so to seeing much. you Pleasure. soon. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. We love, love you, you too. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Go to iTunes and leave a review, and you'll automatically be entered into a drawing to get a free signed copy of the Brain Warriors Way and the Brain Warriors Way cookbook we give away every month.